to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is my health and salvation. All ye who hear, now to His temple draw near. Join me in glad adoration. to the Lord who o'er all things so wondrously reigneth shelter thee under his wings yea so gently sustain it hast thou not seen how thy desires have been granted in what he ordained Set for man thy glory may 
We're going to sing this song here in just a second, but the Lord just really put something on my heart to share with you um, on Friday, actually, and then he told me to wait until Saturday, and then Saturday he told me to wait until this morning. <laughs> so <laughs> I have a story I want to read to you out of um, 2 Chronicles 20. And the scene is there are three armies, three large armies coming against King Jehoshaphat in the land of Israel, and the people are terrified. And in 2 Chronicles 20, Then Jehoshaphat was afraid, and he set his face to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast through all Judah. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. O Lord of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to stand without you. If disaster comes upon us, the sword judgment or pestilence or famine, we will stand before the house and before you. Your name is in this house. And we cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear us and save us. For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you, Lord. Do not be afraid, thus says the Lord. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours, but God's. You will not need to fight in this battle, the Lord says. Stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, and the Lord will be with you. Amen. So they rose early in the morning, much like we did here this morning, and they went out into the wilderness. And when he had taken the counsel from the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy attire as they went before the army in front line battle. The singers of the Lord. The musicians went before the army in frontline battle. And you know what they said? Give thanks to the Lord, for his steadfast love endures forever and ever. And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah. And they all turned against each other, they killed one another. Guess what happened? Their weapon was worship. The Lord told them to stand still. I will fight your battle. But did they just really stand still? Jehoshaphat sent the real army to frontline battle in worship. And they praised the name of the Lord. They gave thanks to him because they knew that their victory was in him. And that is so powerful that the Lord would use our singing. And like I said yesterday, if our hearts aren't right, we're just clinging cymbals. But he calls the singers of the Lord, he calls us to worship as our weapon of warfare. And we need to remember that. So first he prayed, he fasted, then he gathered his people together. He sent them to the front lines, and the enemy was confused by their singing. The Lord used those songs to confuse the enemy, and they wiped each other out. Amen? And like I was talking about yesterday with the hymns, it matters as well, not just our heart, but the songs that we sing. So I encourage you to be in prayer about that with the songs that we choose to listen to. Because they're on the Christian radio doesn't mean they're edifying to the Lord. King Saul asked David to come play his harp for him. And you know what happened when David came and played the harp and sung for King Saul? The demons flee. At the name of Jesus, the demons flee. 
in worship, the demons flee. So as we raise our voices, that's this morning, we are all in frontline battle. We all need to recognize our position in this army. We talked a lot about singing of one accord last night and being of one accord and being of one voice and standing together. And that's what we are called to do. And one more thing, L.A. Marzulli was talking about the crystal skulls, right? And how the Mayan elders all gathered and they had, they resonated standing together. They resonated one, uh, right? They all, all hundreds of those people resonating one. What were they doing? They were opening up a gateway into the darkness. But you know what L.A. Marzulli said on Pastor Paul Bagley's show a couple days ago? We have that power to join our voices in one accord and open up the heavens to pour down windows of blessing as our praises go up, his blessings come down upon us. We have the ability right here to also join in one voice with one accord and open up the heavens. So let's take that back from the enemy and let's raise our voices in this place like no other time before as we come before him in our weapon of warfare, in our worship. Let's sing like we've never sang before.
what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and then proclaim my God how great thou art oh then sings my soul my Savior God to thee Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We stand in awe of you, Lord, and we worship you this morning. Lord, we answer the call to stand in the front line where you have called us to, to sing with all of our heart, to trust you with all of our heart. Lord, we give thanks and praise to you because your love endures forever and ever. Lord, you are long-suffering and gracious and merciful 
And Lord, you look upon us and call us your children. So we just stand before you this morning, Lord, in awe of how great thou art. We love you, Lord. We praise you. Father, all glory and honor and praise is to you and you alone in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We all say together with one accord, amen. How are we all doing this morning? That great. Can we all get kind of seated? Uh, you're in for a real treat. Uh, Pastor Paul Begley, uh, his Bible is right here. I'm actually touching Pastor Paul Begley's Bible. I mean, can you believe that? Um, so, uh, good news. We'll see you guys next year. In order to do that, we, we're going to need your help. You've got to spread the word. You've got to, you've got to tell people out there what, what Hear the Watchman Orange County was all about uh, for us to make it work. So we need your help. I want to thank all of you. You've got like an incredible day ahead of you. I encourage you to stay, like don't leave at noon and go home and play golf or watch football or whatever you do. Stay, stay, stay. Pastor Bagley is, is going to introduce uh, later today uh, his Bible, Bible college or, yeah, and, 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 uh, and you actually get some credit for staying and, and listening to what he and Heidi have to say. It's an incredible program. You don't want to miss that. And we still have some great speakers for you. So uh, thank you. I'll be around all day. And again, uh, you know, it was just such a blessing to have all of you here. And I will see you next year. I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for all of you die hard. California, West Coast, or people traveling from other places to come here and pray for this territory. Pray that this territory is transformed. Please pray for our ministry. It takes a lot of resources to make this happen. Please just pray that we have the financial um, means to continue. We're not there yet. If you have the means to help and you've been totally blessed by this event, we just urge you to, um, there's little pledge envelopes, and if I, we urge you to just just pray about it. And if, if, if it moves you and your heart leads you, we just appreciate anything that you can do. And also, I just wanted to mention that there's a couple um, things going on. At the end of the evening, if you're still here, we are having a special presentation by a woman flying all the way out from Texas she is a expert in CBD and endocannab the endocannabinoid system. A lot of us are feeling sick from all the chemtrailing and all the contaminants in the water and the GMOs. And this one company is the le took the leading edge in research, and their CBD and non-CBD products just have changed my life and my health. And I am so blessed to be part of this um, organization that's helping change lives physically. If you want to learn more about it, it's just an educational event at the end of the, this evening after dinner. So if you're still around and you want to join us and just learn more so that you can be as healthy as possible and build your body up and, and be strong through the coming times, we'd really appreciate your participation and just um, 
just sharing the information and being knowledgeable because you are the future of this state and this area and this country and this world, really. And we need you educated. So that's going to be a total blessing. We also want to make sure you know that there's a Q&A session at the end of the conference, uh, the official conference, followed by the school, uh, Paul Begley's uh, Bible School of Prophecy bonus event, then the CBD event tonight. So we've, we, we just really urge you to participate in the q and A. I, maybe some of you have had questions. Most of the speakers will be up here, and it's a free-for-all where you can come up to the mic like we did at, at uh, Gonz's session earlier in the program. So thank you again. We love you so much. We are so blessed. We feel the power of the Holy Spirit all weekend. And, and we just hope that finally, and, and my, my absolute prayer for all of you, which changed my husband's in my life, was to get water baptized. If you haven't been baptized, just do it. T swallow your pride. Take away your fear. Just get in the water later. We're going to all cheer you on. We invite everybody to go to the pool and pray and cheer the people that, that are getting baptized. And we also want to urge you, if you've already been baptized, don't think, oh, my gosh, I've already been baptized. You know, I can't do it again. No, you can rededicate yourself. And when you get in the water, you just say, I I'd like to rededicate myself. And, and Pastor Paul will bless you. So... Please, it's so powerful. It's just um, symbolic and powerful because if you're in a repentant heart spirit right now, if you're in that mood and you really know that, you, that your life needs changing, the only way that we can change this land is that we trust God and repent and change our evil ways. And you can't do that if you're not truly sorry. And being remorseful means... You feel bad about it, but you keep doing it. Being repentant is truly a heart change where you have no desire to do anything unpleasing to God. And that's where it starts, and that's where you build the full armor of God, that, that you are impenetrable. If you can repent and you're in a repentant, you have a repentant heart, and you, and you have that continuous relationship with Jesus every minute of every day. So we hope that you all can experience that, and we love you, and thank you so much. And I'd like to introduce our fabulous MC for today's Sunday. We, we absolutely are so blessed um, to have a man from the UK with us. And oh my goodness, Mark Sutherland came all the way out from England. So please give him a round of applause. Thanks, David. Good morning. Well done for being here at this time in the morning. Brilliant. So I have the pleasure of introducing someone, and that is Pastor Paul Beckley. So I'm just going to read out a bio of Paul. So Pastor Paul Beckley is excited about salvation. Excuse me, even I have to put my glasses on these days. His gifting lies in evangelizing and Bible prophecy. By the grace of God, thousands have come to Jesus Christ through his ministry. Pastor Paul is a fourth generational preacher, following after his father, grandmother, and great-grandfather, who was blessed to be part of the Azusa Street Revivals. Pastor Paul was ordained by Dr. Lester Summerall in the Lisi Organization of South Bend, Indiana, and studied at Indiana Christian University, as well as under Pastor Charles Begley at the Community Gospel Baptist Church in Knoxville, um, in Indiana, or Knox, Indiana, excuse me, sorry. Pastor Paul Begley has been a pastor for, uh, for over 30 years. Pastor Paul hosts a weekly telecast of the coming apocalypse on the World Harvest Television Networks and the Good Life of Orlando, Florida. Pastor Paul is reaching the world through his internet ministry on YouTube as Paul Begley's 34, which has millions of views and thousands of subscribers. 
Paul Begley also hosts live internet radio broadcasts Monday through Friday and Saturday night live. Pastor Paul Begley has authored six books. These outlets allow him to reach the world with the message of salvation and Bible prophecy as it relates to current events. And it's my absolute pleasure to introduce you, Pastor Paul Begley. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 Somebody's got a great Bible up here. Is this uh, Mr. McGuire? Is that yours? <laughs> okay. Here, let me hand this to you so I can put that. I love to pray the worship leader who has a Bible. Can somebody say amen? How's that for? <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, let me just say thank you for being here this morning. Thank you, and, and God bless. How many's enjoyed this conference this weekend? It's been amazing. I uh, also want to just introduce my beautiful wife of 37 years, Heidi Begley, if she'd stand over here. And uh, she will be speaking this afternoon in that breakout session on the Deborah effect. And uh, it's a powerful message as she's done a complete series on the women of the Bible. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, guys, you don't want to miss this because what happens is when she delivers this message this afternoon, we're talking about our school of prophecy, uh, you'll be encouraged because in the last days, if there was ever a time that we need the power of God to move mightily, it is now. I've got a question. I got this microphone here. Uh, do, do you have a handheld mic? Because anybody know me? I, I feel like a pit bull on a short chain right here. Okay. Okay. Seriously. I'm sorry. I always mess up the AV guys. They, they dread me every year. They dread me every year. Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. How's it? Oh, yes, that's better. Can you say, are you serious? <laughs> All right. Welcome. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to look at the book of Isaiah, uh, Isaiah's apocalypse. And the reason we're going to do that is, first of all, when you think about the prophet Isaiah, he's one of the most powerful prophets of all. And when you study Bible prophecy, this is amazing to me, but most, most theologians and eschatology experts rarely use the book of Isaiah to talk about the end times, when in reality, it is Isaiah who explains how the world will come to an end probably better than anyone. <clears throat> I mean, obviously, we look at Daniel, we look at Ezekiel, we look at Revelation, we study all kinds of Second Thessalonians 2 with the Antichrist, we read Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, Jesus gives us the blueprints of the last days, but it is Isaiah who actually gives us the full plan of God, and, uh, and it's just incredible. Maybe that's why when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, that it was only the book of Isaiah that was in complete intact, not missing one word that was found in the Dead Seas. Can you say amen? Maybe that's why his was the only one. Anyway, in the book of Isaiah, if you go to the ninth chapter, the Bible tells us, first thing, he, he does a lot of prophesying throughout the book, but one thing that Isaiah says is, for unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So it is Isaiah who gives us the proclamation that the Savior will be born, and he's born unto us as a child. So he lets us know that God is going to deliver his only begotten son into the world through the virgin birth of Mary, and she is a remarkable woman chosen by the Lord, finding favor in God, and uh, how powerful it is to know that God can, you can find favor in God. Every person here, absolutely, God has chosen you, he's ordained you, he's lifted you up, he's prepared you for such a time as this. Can you say amen? And you know, all weekend long, the great speakers have referred to you as the remnant church. And there's a reason for that. 
Because those who seek prophecy and the end times and a deeper walk with God usually are about 10% of every congregation of every church across America and around the world. That's the, just the facts of it. It's about 10% or a tithe, okay, or a remnant, uh, a, a just a group that has been, and some might say, well, why doesn't the rest do it? And I asked God about that. God, why don't the rest of the people get into it? He goes, because I haven't selected them. Not everybody can handle the apocalypse. They can ha- but the world seems to be able to handle the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> Which, oh, by the way, when you start talking about the zombie, oh, and I forgot to say it this afternoon, Heidi's going to speak on the Deborah effect. And, you know, guys, if you don't, don't go to sleep because a spike could go through your head, okay? <laughs> but I'm going to be speaking on the Antichrist, the white horseman of the apocalypse, Okay. But if there's one thing for sure, if you start thinking about the zombie apocalypse, what's been going on, I started asking a a question. I said, God, why all the glorification of a zombie apocalypse? What is all the walking dead, the dead of dawn? You know, my mother-in-law's dead. I mean, I can get into that. Some of these terrible things that they show, they keep coming up with, you know, my husband died, and they got all these zombie things. But why would they do this? What, what is the infatuation with the glorification of a zombie apocalypse? Eating flesh, World War Z. And the Lord said, the Lucifer knows about the second resurrection. The Bible says that the hour will come. It says it in the book of Daniel and in also Revelation. And even Jesus said it. For the hour will come when all them that are in the graves are going to hear my voice. Some that are come, be, come out be, for the resurrection of life and others the resurrection of damnation. We always are into the resurrection of life. Can somebody say amen? amen? The saints of God are looking forward to being raptured to be with the Lord or to be raised from the dead. For the dead in Christ shall rise first and us that are alive and remain shall be caught up forever to be with the Lord and so shall we be with the Lord. We all shout amen to that. Because, you know, we've been set free. We've been bought by a price. We're not our own anymore. We belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And because he saved us and washed us with his precious blood, he's given us the divine appointment and divine atonement that has saved our soul from sin and given us the power of the Holy Ghost to live victoriously in this world. Amen? But there's another resurrection of the damned. And the Bible says, because all are going to come out of the grave, some that have done good under the resurrection of life, and they're going to rise first. It says that, and us that are alive and remain will be caught up forever to be with the Lord in the air, and so shall we be with the Lord. Okay. But what about the, what about the people left behind? And then what about the resurrection of the damned? So, okay, let's say you don't give your life to Christ. Let's say you're sitting here today. You've come to this conference. You're trying to find out what are all these crazy people about with Nephilim and UFOs. And now this guy's up there talking about the zombies. <laughs> and the other guy was talking about 5G. And then we had these guys that were ex- astro projecting. And there was, we've heard a lot of things this weekend. But why in the world, what happens to those that once the Lord returns and the, the redeemed of God are caught up to be with the Lord? What happens to the people who are left behind. Because the Bible said that then the resurrection of the damned takes place. That means they don't come out of the grave with a brand new body like unto the Lord, right? They don't have a glorified body like unto Christ. That's what the redeemed have. But they do come out of the grave. And they don't go up in the air to catch Jesus in the clouds. So what do they do? Well, Lucifer knows what they're going to do. They're going to crawl out of the graves. They will not have a glorified, their flesh will be corruptible, not incorruptible. And yet they will be trapped in a world of sin. And the people that are still on the earth, what do they do? 
when they see the, those souls that were lost coming from the graves and they themselves seeing the church leave and wondering what is going to happen. You talking about an apocalypse. I don't think even Hollywood can even make this understanding. It is not a glorification. It is not something to praise and look for. It's not something we should all be happy about. This will be the most dread. This is why the Bible says we're waiting for the great and terrible day of the Lord. Can you say amen? It's great for the redeemed. It'll be terrible for the lost. So if you're Lucifer, and we go and just turn your, uh, if you have your Bible, go now to Isaiah chapter 9. We'll just stay in Isaiah for a moment. And here's what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. I read the, the uh, child will be born. And now, uh, turn, if you will, into Isaiah chapter um, 14, and it starts to talk about this. Lucifer knows this is coming, so he has to put together a plan. Now, from the very beginning, we heard L.A. Marzulli talk about the seed war yesterday, right? And how that Lucifer wants to eat the seed, the seed of the woman. The first prophecy was ever given, Genesis 3.15. For the Lord spoke to Lucifer and said, I am going to put enmity between thy seed and the seed of the woman. And he will bruise your head and it will bruise his heel. Genesis 3.15. It's the first prophecy by God. And who's he give it to? Lucifer. And he tells Lucifer, your plan's not going to work. I already know your thoughts from afar off. I will send a, a child will be born and this will be the seed of God. He is the only begotten son of the Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have life everlasting. And Jesus Christ, my only begotten son, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah, will rise up in the final day and crush the head of the serpent. So L.A. did a great job yesterday showing you all the serpent mounds, how all over the world this, loose, this spirit of Lucifer this uh, technology of the fallen angels found the book of Enoch, which was actually quoted by Jude, who constantly talked about how the angels would be reserved in the chains of everlasting darkness under the perdition of ungodly men. Peter says the same thing. So Lucifer knows he's in trouble. So what does he do? He tries to stop the plan of God. He knows the Messiah is coming the first time. So what's he do? He tries to corrupt the flesh in Genesis 6. The fallen ones come. They look upon the daughters of men. They see that they're fair. They have children, they, um, great men of renown. These men are Nephilim, Rephahims, uh, you know, Bohemian. I mean, there's all kinds of hemes. And, the, and they're running around, and they're, and they're teaching men uh, uh, wickedness and violence. And the Bible says that men's hearts were on evil continually. Every imagination of the heart on evil. The world was filled with violence. Even Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. The, and so all of the sin that was taught was brought down upon humanity. And so then, so Lucifer is trying to corrupt the flesh of people. He's trying to ruin us as God's creation and God is so frustrated with it that he finally says look I can't deal with this no more I'm just going to wipe this creation out but thank God God saw a man a preacher of righteousness by the name of Noah and he and, and, and when he saw him he's, the Bible says and Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord is there anybody here that God found grace did you find grace in his eyes huh Wow. I mean, some of us, we weren't fit to be saved. Amen. I mean, you'd say, there's no way I should get saved. I mean, you know, and I've, and I've talked to a lot of folks and they'll say, Paul, you don't know how bad I was. And I'll say, well, it couldn't be. He goes, no, 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 no. You don't know how bad I was. There was one guy who wrote a song back in Indiana says he reached way below the bottom for me that night, okay? So God can save. He is going to save. The Bible says, for the grace of God which bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaches us on denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live righteously, soberly, and godly in this present world. So Lucifer says, I've got to corrupt humanity. And, of course, he does. But he fails in his plan because God sends a deliverer by the name of Noah who spends 100 years plus building an ark out of gopher wood that has three sides, has three levels in it, and one door and a window on top. 
And all, all the animals even hear the voice of the Lord. And they get in two by two and seven of the clean. And as they all get in there, God is so merciful, he leaves the door open seven more days. And yet humanity rejects him. Keep that in mind because that is a picture that is an actual prophetic uh, event that will replay itself in the last days. Three levels for the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Christ is in the mid-level. He's the door into the sheepfold. There's no other way. Jesus said there's no other name in heaven or given among men, whereby men must be saved. Paul told us that. Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way. The Dalai Lama does not have salvation for mankind. Buddha None of the other uh, idol-worshiping gods. I go to India and I preach there. I'm so glad for churches in America. I'm going to tell you why. When you go to India you, and you're driving through the countryside, you see temple after temple, God after God, and you see and these, these big temples with dragons with tongues that are 20 foot long, and people are going there, and there's cows walking around everywhere, and people are starving to death, and they're going, and what little bit of rice they have, they're putting it at the feet of the, or the altar of their God, and they're clinging, they get hanging gods all over the place, and everybody's worshiping, so there's a million gods there, and people do not know the way to salvation. And even when I preached there in the jungle, and thousands came and they were saved, and we, and we bust them in on the back of pickup trucks, dump trucks actually. I got there and I had rented a place, I had a big tent put up, and we rented the chairs, and we got everything set up for them, and rented the PA, and we rented everything. And then I even had these guys that go get buses, they were to bring people in from the four different villages, because I held this outside crusade, and the middle of the jungle because it's illegal to hold an outside crusade in India. You have to have a permit from the government, and President Modi is not very fond of Christianity. So I'm, I can't get a permit, so just go out in the jungle and then bring them in from the four villages. And so I had a bus company who was scheduled to bring the people in, but when it come time for the, about three days before, the news started spreading because we sent people into the four villages with flyers saying that there's Pastor Paul Begley's coming to preach. It's going to be a crusade in the middle of the jungle. We'll pick you up here. We'll bring you back here. They're going to feed you a huge meal. Come hear what this man's got to say. Word started to spread that there was a bunch of people wanting to go, and so they put a threat out to anyone that goes. And so the, the bus drivers got threatened, so they all canceled the contract, and they said they wouldn't do it. So what do you do when the bus drivers won't bring the people to the jungle? What do you do when the government says you can't have the service? You go find the dump truck, guys, because they'll take a deal from anybody. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Found the dump trucks. So I paid the dump truck, guys, and, and they said they would do it. And so we sent the dump trucks out. And, folks, we have video footage of it. I didn't bring it, but... 250 people packed in the back of dump trucks in 106 degree heat in India, riding all the way out into the jungle to hear some crazy guy from Indiana tell him that there's a God that can actually set him free. Because Satan might be working the seed war, but Christ is working the redemption war and praise God, through his name, all men can be saved. And so they, they came out, and there was a 1,000 people, and, they, and then the truck, the, the, each dump truck driver said, There's, I left half of them behind. So you know what I told them? Go get them. Will you pay us double? They negotiate in India. <laughs> yes, go get them. And we'll feed you dinner. That won't, We want it right there. Anybody ever love goat stew and curry? Big pot. It's a huge pot. I mean, the pot was almost like half the size of the stage. And they put all the, go the goats in there and, uh, and uh, the curry and, and rice. And, and they, they had this big stick, and a guy would throw it like that, and he'd go around. They had four people catching it. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and then I almost felt like rock. Remember? And then he goes, oh, smell what they got cooking. <laughs> but really, it was pretty good stuff. And so at the end of the day, here came another 1,000 people. We had 2,000 people. We preached that day in extreme heat. Over 350 of them came to Jesus Christ for salvation. And uh, then I made the wrong mistake by saying, anybody sick, we'll pray for you. And the preacher looked at me and said, you just messed up because almost everybody came forward. They're all sick because there's no doctors. They have, uh, it's really tough out there. And Orissa, India, is very difficult. The bottom line for saying that is this. All over I drove and there was no churches. 
very hard to find a church. Now, in the cities, a little bit here and there, and some of the, some of the but a lot of villages are controlled completely by the radical Hindus. There's no way. So there was nowhere for people to go to actually hear anything about Jesus. So when you think about America, thank God you can get in a car and drive down the streets of any state in this country and all over, and there's churches and steeples all over the place where at least people can go and hear about Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? We really need that. The Bible says the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. So praise God for that. All right, so Satan's got a plan, but he failed. So his next plan is if I can't stop him with the flood, I will try to prevent the Messiah from coming into the world. So his attack is now on the Jewish people. And so Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph sold into bondage into Egypt. And they go through the whole process of 400 years of slavery, or 430, whichever book you're reading. And as they go through all the slavery, and all of the ways of Pharaoh, and all of the hatred toward them, they continue to keep the word of God. They continue to walk in faith in the midst of the persecution. They continue to refuse to bow to give up. I mean, 400 years is a long time for a people to be in oppression, generation after generation after generation, dying in slavery, and yet the word of God's prophetic promise that Isaiah gives that unto, when he says that a child shall be born, when he says that, that, the, that the Prince of Peace is coming, these people, through all of this hatred, hang on to one thing, the precious promises of the word of God. Folks, I don't care if the Isaiah, I don't care if the apocalypse, it doesn't matter to me what happens next. Don't ever let go of your faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Don't let go. Hang on. Well, of course, whenever it came time that Moses would be here, Moses, of course, is born and his mama puts him in the, 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 uh, the rumor spread. Lucifer knows. Rumor spread. A king, a deliverer has been born. Somebody's been born. He's a deliverer of the people. Word gets to Pharaoh. Pharaoh's concerned. Pharaoh says, okay, we got to stop this thing. Kill all the Jewish children under the age of two. Slaughter them all. Don't you wonder when we have 66 million children are slaughtered in this country since 1973 through abortion? Don't you wonder, what was, there was, oh my, how many prophets, how many anointed worship leaders, how many prayer warriors, how many God-fearing people was Lucifer trying to stop, trying to stop, trying to stop the second coming of Jesus Christ, trying to stop the church, trying to stop the move of God? People do not understand the consequences of sin, but God still his word is still true his promise is still real and you cannot stop the prophecy of the Lord one thing's for sure never one, not one prophecy that God has ever given will ever fail can you say amen not, not one and so try to kill the babies mama puts little Moses in a little basket and floats him in the bulrushes and the Nile River makes him alligator bait he's out there floating around and all of a sudden, Pharaoh's daughter decides to go and bathe. While she's in the Nile, she hears a baby cry. And what's amazing to me about that is their babies are crying everywhere. People are being slaughtered everywhere. But she hears one specific cry. And when she sees the child, she has compassion on this one. Because the Bible says he was a proper child. In other words, he was an anointed child. And so she decides to keep this one for herself. And they get one of the, they say, we got to get somebody to help nurse this child along for you. And they find a lady, and it happens to be Moses' mother. Perfect. So Moses ends up spending 40 years learning the ways of the Egyptians, being raised as the son of Pharaoh. But at the same time, his mother's teaching him the ways of God. Sometimes people ask, how come President Trump actually got in the White House this last time? Do you know the story? Do you know that his mother was an intercessory prayer warrior in the Presbyterian church? She led the prayer group. She was a godly woman who prayed constantly. And he's seen the miracles and the power of prayer from the, his mother's life while his father was a little bit on the other side. Hard-nosed businessman, slamming this and that, uh, doing, you know, doing what he needs to do. 
Little Donald grows up in an environment where he's, he's almost like he's trained on one side and he's trained on the other. He learns the ways of the pharaohs, but he knows the ways of God. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. You don't get where you're going unless somebody first prayed the way for you. My mama is the prayingest woman I know on the face of the earth. And then my grandmother prayed more than her. And then my great-grandfather decided to, he's riding horseback throughout eastern Kentucky and eastern Tennessee and West Virginia as an evangelist. He was a circuit rider preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when he found out the Azusa Street revival broke out, he decided to get on a train and go all the way out here to L.A. where he could get in on where the power of God was moving in a miraculous way. He came back to the eastern part of Kentucky and the churches were scared of him because he was glowing with the Holy Ghost. So he just started preaching praise God on on steps of people's uh, uh, porches and and, and schoolhouses and hundreds came into the hollers and heard the anointed gospel of Christ they were saved they were healed revivals broke out all over the land somebody will pray and carve a way for you and you're praying and carving a way for someone else your children they are yours, but they belong to the Lord. And no matter how out of whack they get, you just stand on the promises that this is for you, for your children's children, even them that are afar off. Can you say amen? amen. So it's really important. So Moses, you know, Moses learns the ways. But when he sees one of his brethren being killed, he's so angry, he kills an Egyptian. And then he decides to leave. So 40 years under Pharaoh, and then 40 years in the wilderness where he's on the backside of the mountain taking care of his mother-in-law's sheep, his, brother, his uh, father-in-law, Jethro, sheep. And he's out there, and he gets married, and he figures this is where he's going to be before God speaks to him in the burning bush. And he has to go back, and God says, you're going back to Egypt like Mike and Jeannie. you got to go back to California. Now, wait a minute, God. You had your, you, you've had your reprieve, but now you have to go back. I'm not saying you have to stay there because Moses didn't have to stay there either. But you might have to shake off a few snakes. You might have to deal with a few plagues. There might be some hardships and situations. Folks, in our life, anything that's worth fighting for, you need to go ahead and fight for it. Can you say amen? The Bible says the violent, the, 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 uh, take it by force. The violent take it by force, okay? In other words, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, but the violent take it by force. We're persecuted all the time, but we continue to stand for the truth. So let's go here. Isaiah's apocalypse. Because if Satan couldn't kill, if he couldn't kill Moses and they get out of Egypt and the whole story, then he's got to kill the children of Israel. So he has giants. We're back to the seed. So he's got giants waiting for Joshua after 40 years in the wilderness. Lucifer says, all right, I'm, that plan didn't work, but we'll be waiting for him because this is coveted land because God made a covenant with Abraham to leave your kindred and your family and I'll take you to a place where I'll show you. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob's 12 sons, 12 tribes, 400 years, Moses drinking water out of the rock, Manna falling from heaven, quail up to your nails, not Steve Quail. Thank God. You know, this is a, this is a true story. Somebody called me and asked me if I would be in a conference with Steve Pigeon. Uh, no, there's a guy named Steve. I didn't know that. I said, you mean quail. They said, no, we mean pigeon. I said, oh, come on now. I said, if we ever have a conference with Steve Quail, Steve Pigeon, and the Birdman, we're going to have a lot of problems. So anyway, uh, you, you, you come to this, I mean, they go through all this stuff, and finally it's time to cross in the Canaan. But when they get ready to cross, it's not Moses going, it's Joshua and Caleb, because they had the faith, they had a good report, that no matter if the giants are 12 foot tall, we can take them. Can you say amen? amen. So the church says, Pastor, I can't deal with the apocalypse that's coming. I can't deal with the, with the, 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 the end times. I can't deal with the new world order. I can't deal with the, uh, all of the uh, uh, hatred to the church, the persecution. I can't deal with all of the things that are going to happen in Matthew 24, the wars, the rumors of wars, nation turning against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famine, pestilence, earthquakes. We got everything, folks. Uh, Japan just got hit with the largest typhoon in 60 years years. 
Uh, last time I just looked this morning, 33 are dead, 100 are missing. Buildings are being wiped out everywhere. They've never seen a storm like it. Our son just moved to, our son and daughter-in-law and granddaughter just moved to Okinawa a month ago. And the first thing that happens, a storm forms out there named Hagabus. And, and this storm is the largest storm in 60 years headed right for Okinawa. And I said, come on now. They just got there. We, they're going to be there four years. We're going to have to deal with typhoons, monsoons, blood moons, uh, earthquakes, and whatever else that's going to hit out there. And the Lord says, pray. So we prayed. God, I said, turn the storm. And it kept going and going and going, and all of a sudden, it hooked right. It hooked right. It hooked right. And it did miss Okinawa completely, but unfortunately, it hit the mainland, Japan. It's done tremendous damage there. We'll find out more about that in the next few hours. Landslides there. There's going to be many catastrophes. There's going to be many, many, many. The extreme weather condition is getting worse. There's talk of, of course, you've heard about Planet X or Nibiru or Planet Number 9 or or the Goblin or they got all kinds of names for it now. And there's the question of whether it even exists or not. Well, let's say we don't know whether it exists or not, but let's say what's something's shaking the heavens. Jesus said, in the last days, for there shall be signs in the sun, the moon, the stars, Distress of nations with perplexity. The sea and the waves will be roaring. Men's hearts have failed them for fear, for things coming upon the earth, for the power of heaven shall be shaken. So the heavens are going to be shaken. The earth's going to be quaking. My knees are going to be breaking. It's going to get bad. And uh, there's going to be uh, uh, these catastrophes, these, these uh, events are all prophesied in the Bible, including the book of Isaiah in the 24th chapter, if you go with me there. Lucifer knows that his destiny is sealed in Isaiah 14 when he's told that he will be thrown down into the pits of hell. But in Isaiah 24, the Lord begins to tell us what's going to happen. So as the church enters into this age, we're not to be afraid, but to stay on fire for God. We're not to go into the last days dreading it, but you should, if those who know their God shall do mighty exploits. Can you say amen? Amen. We are going to thrive in the end days, not just survive. Oh, I got to say that twice. We're not going to hide. We're not going to survive. We're going to thrive in the last days. You say, how are we going to do that? Because we're not going to operate in the world's way of thinking. We're going to operate in faith. You see, whenever there's a plague in the land that there's no vaccine for and they're dying like flies, you can either go to the CVS Minute Clinic or you can get on your knees and pray Psalms 91 that no no uh, 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 disease shall come nigh your dwelling. You can start quoting Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against me shall prosper and every tongue that rises against me you shall condemn in judgment. You can stand in there and refuse to allow the circumstances around you to dictate your life because if God be for you, who can be against you? Can you say amen? Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. He said, I'll make you a conqueror, more than a conqueror, through Christ that strengthens you. Amen. Amen. So you've got power in the name of Jesus. So when the whole world's falling apart and people are freaking out and folks don't know where to turn, you'll be turning to Christ and supernaturally God will provide. He said, David said, I was young and now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor their seed begging bread. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He will also give people witty inventions who will be already in preparation and in position to help the saints of God. There will be networking going on supernaturally. And even if they shut off the social media network, you can't stop people from praying. And that prayer leads you by the Holy Ghost to find other believers who will be somewhere else gathering. Here's what's going on in India. The greatest revival right now, probably the the beginning of the end time revival started in Iran, really. Where the women in Iran, well, here's what's happened. 40 years after the Shah of Iran was thrown out and the Ayatollah Ali Khomeini took over and a forced Sharia law mentality was being put upon the people trying to force the whole country to follow a Shiite, Shiite radical Islam. 
It's working so well, the mosques are empty. Friday prayers, there's four or five showing up. Now, they all talk the talk, but they're not really walking the walk. And the only reason that people think that the, it's just because the regime is radicalized, but the people don't really buy into it. So the women in Iran decided there's got to be a better way. And they started praying to Jesus Christ. And they started getting saved. They were getting dreams and visions. And then the women started getting together. And they started having little meetings. And meeting over here and there. And now, after about 10 years, there's been an unbelievable move of God in Iran. The women under, and, and men too. But men are, are more in the, in the society. They got to be a lot more careful because they're more, vi more visual. The women are already been told to stay down, stay quiet, be, wear the burqa and, you know, stay out of the way. So it's easier for them to actually meet and have church. And they're doing it and it's powerful. And people are being saved everywhere. But women also know this, that if they are arrested or they're caught, they will be raped, beaten, and murdered in that order. And they know it. And you know what their favorite verse is? Lord, I present my body a living sacrifice unto you, holy and acceptable before you, which is my reasonable service. Think about that prayer. In other words, if they catch me and I die, I'm presenting my body a living sacrifice to you, Lord. You don't think there's power in that prayer? That's why there's a revival breaking out in Iran. And thou, oh, hallelujah. And that's the reason that the Iranian regime will be toppled because it won't be because the United States or some other uh, superior uh, weaponry. It'll be because of the power of prayer in Iran because God prophesied in that book that he will even set his kingdom in Persia, which is in Iran. Can you say amen? <laughs> Take that, Ayatollah. Take that. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, if the NSA is listening or if you're here. I won't say nothing else. If you're here or you're listening, I want you to know. Well, and I was talking to Troy Anderson, okay? Talking to Troy, he'll be speaking later today. Troy said, Hey, I got a visit from the CIA. I said, Oh, well, LA got visited too. Uh, I said, I got visited four times so far, and, and now they won't leave me alone. And uh, he said, uh, well, here's the deal, though. I had a real good lunch, and the guy wants me to help him write a book. I said, you got favor with God. I still got problems with the NSA. <laughs> well, we, we found this one lady would want to help us write uh, and, and work with us because we've got to put all a lot of workbooks together for our school and everything, and we, we wanted to help. So we was trying to find a lady to help us who's a good writer and we asked her, said, could you help us kind of be like a ghost writer with us? And she said, no, I'll, I won't be a ghost writer. I'll be a Holy Ghost writer. <laughs> Can somebody say amen? I like her. So anyway, what, what God is doing, he's putting people in position to do different things. Your circumstance does not dictate your call. God calls you, you will rise above the rest of it. When I got called to preach, I was 22 years old. I'll never forget it. I stood up and read from the, I went into a church, it wasn't even mine. I went in there, there was a big convention going on, about 150 people. There was 22 pastors. I was sitting in the back and the Lord said, you're going to get up there and read Luke 4.18, for the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has anointed me to preach the gospel. You're going to read it, you're going to close the Bible, and you're going to sit down just like Jesus did. And exact words, because it's actually Isaiah 61. So I got up there at the age of 22, I read the scripture, I closed the Bible, I went back, I sat down, the people looked at me like I was like an alien. And, and then, so then I, the next Sunday I went to my dad's church, and he said, all right, Pastor Paul, or Paul Begley, my son has just announced he's going to be preaching, so we're going to let him get up and say a few words. So I got up to preach. And there was only 40 people in the church that morning. And 25 of them got up and walked out of the church in the service and left. There was only 15 people left. And I said, I, I didn't know what happened. Maybe a death in a family. You know, I didn't know, what, what, I didn't know what happened. I was saying, pray for them. I don't know what happened. Maybe something bad's happened. You know what the bad something was? They didn't believe. They sent, called my dad that afternoon and said, we're quitting the church. If you're going to put him up there, we're leaving and we won't be back. That, that's, that's how I got into the ministry, okay? Welcome to the ministry. <laughs> I said, Dad, if you want me, if you, he goes, no. Oh, no. No, no, no. You'll be preaching next Sunday. You better study, okay? 
And so we continued on. See, things that you do for God don't always get, you don't always get celebrated. Sometimes you have to be tolerated. There was this one guy in, in, uh, in North Judson, Indiana, where Heidi and I grew up. The guy, all he did was witness to everybody, okay? So if you went to the grocery store and he was there, he hunted you down in the aisle. Do you know Jesus? He did this to everybody. He witnessed to me three times, and I was his pastor. I'm in the store, and he see, goes, oh, Pastor Bagley, do you know Jesus? <laughs> I know him quite well, but do you have a personal relationship with him? Yes. I thought about that later. He didn't care that I said I was a Christian or that I said I went to church. He wanted to know if I had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Because you know, if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, then you don't have Jesus Christ. Because he's a personal Savior. And he loves you. He died for you, for your salvation, for your healing. He wants you to be blessed and highly favored. He wants you, he wants you to be healed if you're sick. He wants you to prosper. He wants you, people come to me, pray for me that I can get a new job. Pray for me, I've got applications. Should I pray for the Lord to bless them to get this job they want? Or should I tell them, no, God doesn't really care about your finances? What should I do? Of course. Why? Because if you, anyone here that's ever been in an economic struggle, do you not ask God to help you? Then why would we then hate on someone if God blesses them? Sometimes the, the mentality of the Christian relationship gets twisted. It's okay to pray for God to help you in your needs. It's okay to ask God for that new job. It's okay to pray for someone else. And if someone's sick, pray for them to be healed. It's okay to, it's okay to start, if you start a business, how many people start a business to go broke? Is it okay to start a business? Are you, do you start a business to go broke? Do you, st do you want to prosper? Do you pray for God to bless your business? Then why should we not pray for people to be blessed? Hmm. So we're getting messed up in our thought. And listen, the Bible says that the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. And God wants to have, make sure that the kingdom of God, that the people of God have the resources and finances to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. And especially in America, because we're the greatest nation in the world. We have a responsibility. We have an obligation to take the gospel message to the world. He will bless you if you believe it. He will help you if you ask him. He will be with you through everything, thick or thin, up or down, naked or abundance. It doesn't matter. Whatever state you're in, God will bless you. I'm preaching this, for God's telling me, because the apocalypse or the things that Isaiah says is coming, people are going to have to have more than a shallow religion. You're going to have to have a deep personal relationship with Christ whenever the t things change. Whenever you, if, what if you was in a time, I'm going to ask this question. It's easy to say, Pastor Begley, I'll never take the mark of the beast. If they actually start that, I won't do it. But do you understand the pressure that the world will be under, the people, to deny Christ, to live as Christ, to die as game? Can you imagine the pressure? Children to feed. Mortgage that can't be met. Everything that you know in life stripped from you. Hated, persecuted. Jesus said, you'll be persecuted. In Matthew 24, he tells you, some of you are going to be hated. Some will be thrown in prison. Some will be put to death. But he that endured to the end, the same shall be saved. The Bible tells us that there will be five living in one house. Three will be against two. Two will be against three. The Bible says you'll be betrayed and by brethren and kindred or family. Do you know what happened during the Holocaust? People actually started turning on one another in survival mode. People did everything they could to survive. It is a natural instinct. 
We sometimes think, I don't have to worry about that, but people all over the world are already suffering this, whether you're in Syria or Iraq, and ISIS was chopping off Christians' heads, and Christians refused to renounce Christ, and they died. And that's why the Bible says that under the altar of God are the souls that have been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's not a shouting message right there. I understand that. But it is the Bible, and we start talking about the apocalypse or times like we've never seen, people just have to have a spiritual understanding how strong you need to be in the Lord. But believe me, the Lord will not leave you or forsake you. He's going with you all the way, okay, even to the end of the world. So let's read what it says in Isaiah 24. The Bible says, the Bible says, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste. And turneth it upside down and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. Sounds like a pole shift to me. The Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste and turneth it upside down. Scattereth, the, uh, uh, scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. Verse 3, the land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled for the Lord has spoken this word. The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The world languisheth and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do languish. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the laws and changed the ordinances and broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore has the curse devoured the earth. So the world is in trouble. And we're in the world, but we're not of the world. We are not going to suffer the wrath of God. Not one Christian will ever suffer the wrath of God. Can you say amen? amen. You've not been appointed under wrath. Judgment is coming upon those that have walked away from God or have not followed God. Salvation has come to us through Jesus Christ. He will provide. He will be there for us. He will bring us through it, and we will march into heaven gloriously. We're not going to crawl in. We're not going to barely skim in, but we're saved by grace through faith. It's not in ourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We're going to heaven under the redemption power, the atonement of the blood of Jesus Christ. There's 12 gates for a reason. There's so many people going to heaven, they can't crowd them all into one gate. Praise God. Praise the Lord. So can you imagine what John saw in Revelation chapter 9, when he, uh, chapter 7, when he saw a number that no man could number coming to God unto, into heaven. He said they were from every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people, and they were all washed in the blood of the Lamb. And one of them said to the elders, said, Who are these that have come out with their robes made white in the blood of the Lamb? He said, These are the days that have come out of the great tribulation. They've come. They're here. These are the saints of God that are coming. Folks, I believe the greatest revival in history is about to break. I'm telling you, I'm not saying it because I just like it. it. The Bible says it. It's going to start in Jerusalem just like it did in the early church. To early church, the, the day of Pentecost came, 120 were in the upper room. The fire of God fell. They began to pray in the Holy Ghost. They began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The power of God was heard. People outside in Jerusalem, this was the feast of the Pentecost. There were Jews from every nation gathered in Jerusalem to keep the feast of, of Pentecost. They heard what was going on. They thought these people were drunk. They said, what is going on up there in that upper room? And they said, no, they're not drunk, Peter said, but this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters are going to prophesy. The old men are going to dream dreams. Young men are going to see visions. And upon my handmaids and servants, I'll pour out my spirit. Thus saith the Lord. Can you say amen? amen. Acts 2, Joel 2. This is that. Now, the revival that's about to break loose. Oh, my Lord. The Lord says, go there now. Okay, all right, Lord. Okay. Praise God. I'm trying to preach on the apocalypse. He said, yeah, we'll get that. Hang on. Praise God. Okay, so go with me to Revelation 7, because I want to read to you what it says in the word of the Lord. The Bible says this great revival. Now, think about it. The early church, the early church starts in Jerusalem with these Jews. They get saved. The Bible says that same day, 3,000 are saved that same day. 3,000 died when Moses got the law from off Mount Sinai, uh, there was 3,000 that died that day, but the day that the Lord sent the Holy Ghost, 3,000 were saved. The Lord was showing you that a new day had come, a new covenant had come. The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life, and God was going to bless his people. Amen? And so, the, so it started in Jerusalem, 3,000 were saved. A few days later in Acts 3, 
The man that laid the gate called Beautiful. Peter and John came, being the hour of prayer. They went to the temple. This man sat there begging alms. But whenever Peter looked at him and said, hey, look on us. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, take up your bed and walk. And the Bible says that Peter looked at him and he lifted up his eyes expecting to receive something. I'm going to tell you something right now. How many people are going to get baptized this afternoon? Stand up if you're going to get baptized. Stand up right now. Stand up right now. Right now. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Give the Lord praise. Praise God. Praise God. Now, wait a minute. These are the people expecting to receive something, but I promise you something, that there's more of you sitting in the pew right now in the seat that are also going to get baptized. You don't know it yet, but you're going to. Because, see, sometimes we come to church expecting one thing, but God brings us something else. Can you say amen? Whenever people make the decision to, to step out on faith, when people hear the voice of God, that little small voice speaks to you and says, you know what, he's right. It's time to get a personal relationship. It's time to rededicate. It's time to recommit. It's time to get born again. It's time to get serious with your life, your soul. It's hanging in the balance here. Why not start living victorious? Why not have the blessing of God in your life? Why not be? Why not get in the morning, get up every morning and dance a little bit in the Holy Ghost and say, that's what my mama does, praise God. <laughs> well, why does my mama get up? And my daddy says, what are you doing? She says, I love the Lord. <laughs> but you would too if you had cancer and they removed a tumor the size of a football off your chest and you went through and the doctors weren't sure of your, whether you was going to live or not. And we, put, we went to mama's house when we heard she was sick and we put healing scriptures all over the walls and on the refrigerator I shall not die, but I shall live and declare the works of the Lord. Any two would agree, but touching any one thing, it shall be done. By his stripes we are healed, another Isaiah scripture. The son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. And we put these scriptures everywhere. By his stripes you were healed. Oh, now we got past tense healing by faith. Mama would get up and walk around. Look on the refrigerator doors, a healing scripture. There was one on the mirror in the bathroom. They're on the walls in the hallway. And then finally one day, she's laying in bed, and she turns her face to the wall. You have to understand the reason. The reason we wanted to put scriptures all over her house, because when I was seven years old, my mom made me memorize 200 Bible verses at age seven. I said, what? That's the first time I went, are you serious? <laughs> the first time I ever said it. She said, then you're going to learn five a day, then you can go play. And I went, what? But I was a quick learner, okay? So I would study, and I would study, and I'd go see Mama. I'd quote them, and I'd get four right, and I'd uh, go back. i go back and study some more and come back. So I did this, and I learned 200 memory verses one summer at the age of seven. Now, I can't remember them today. But you know what? It's amazing. Sometimes when I get preaching, they come out of nowhere because they're hidden in my heart. Oh, come on, somebody. I'll start preaching, and the Holy Ghost will get on me, and all of a sudden I'll just quote a scripture that I haven't read in maybe, you know, six months or a year, and it just comes out of nowhere. I'm like, whoa, where'd that come from? Because God hid it in my heart because my mama believed that this word of God was true. So guess what? Now mama's sick. We're putting scriptures on. I didn't put 200, but I put a lot of them up there for her. Mama, look at that. Mama, well, you know what it says. So now my mama lays down in the bed one morning, and she remembered that Hezekiah was sick unto death. And he turned himself to the wall, the wall of Jerusalem, where the temple was, where the God dwelt. She rolled over in the bed. She turned herself to her own wall, and she said, God, you healed Hezekiah after the prophet Isaiah. Oh, I just want to say this. This prof he prophesies everything from the, the, the birth of John the Baptist, the birth of Christ, the apocalypse, the atonement, everything. Isaiah 53, everything. And he's also the prophet that sent in to tell Hezekiah, you're sick unto death, you better get your house in order because you're going to die. This is no false prophet. Everything this man's ever said has come true. And that's the man that gets sent into Hezekiah. Can you imagine that? But guess what? And he leaves. 
He tells the king, you're going to die. Get your house in order. You're going to die. And he leaves. And he gets almost to the gate. When Hezekiah turns to the wall and asks God to heal him and forgive him of his sins. And God says, I will heal you and give you 15 more years. Hezekiah says, if that's true, then you need to show me a sign. And the Lord said, I will move the sun 10 degrees. And Hezekiah said, that's easy. Move it backwards 10. Come on, somebody. Sometimes you just need a confirmation. I heard somebody talking to someone saying, you need to learn. Oh, that was Michael Bodia. I heard him witnessing to somebody in the, in the room over there. And they asked a question about how you know what God wants you to do. And he said, put the fleece out. Sometimes you've got to put the fleece out. Sometimes you've got to ask God for a sign. It's okay to do it. He'll answer it. He's a God that loves you and cares. And he wants to 100% sure you know that he knows. So he says, then you move it backwards. And God said, I'll move it backwards. You're going to be healed. And so Hezekiah believes the word and says, stop that prophet and bring him back in here. So the prophet's almost to the gate when he stops and the Holy Ghost stops him and says, turn around, change my mind, he's living. Go back in and tell him. What? <laughs> They'll think I'm crazy. Crazy. That's when, that's why, uh, uh, crazy for trying. That's where Willie Nelson got that song. Patsy Klein. Why am I doing that, Heidi? Why do I do that? Why did you marry me? Was it my blue eyes? Crying in the rain. No. Turn around, prophet. Turn around and go back and tell the king, change my mind, he's going to live. And tell him I'm going to move the sun back 10 degrees. And he goes back and it says, hey, I got good news for you. You're going to live. I can hear Hezekiah saying, serious <laughs> that this dude actually turned around and came back another sign that God's going to do what he says he's going to do and you know, of course we know the story well, back to my mama because mama said can I live the Lord said she said can, what you did for Hezekiah I want you to do for me heal me of this cancer and give me 15 more years and the Lord spoke to her in her spirit and said I will heal you I will heal you and you will get your 15 years that was 20 years ago. My mama's still getting up and dancing. Now you know why she dances? Now you know why my mama dances. She started dancing before she even got her healing. Because, listen, let me tell you something. If you're going to wait, you can't wait till the walls fall down to shout. You got to shout before the walls fall down. Joshua said, shout. The walls were still there. It's the accursed city. There's Nephilims all over the land. And Joshua's saying, shout. And then the walls fell down. Faith is a substance of things you're hoping for and the evidence of things not seen. Faith is a fact, say it. Faith is a fact, say it. Faith is a fact. It's the evidence of a, it's evidence of things not seen. So in other words, for something to be evidence in a court of law, it has to be tangible, right? So faith is tangible. Faith is evidence. You don't see it, but it's a, it's a substance. It's, it's, it's real. So if faith is a fact, then your faith walk is a fact. And if faith is a fact and your faith walk is a fact, and if your faith is in Jesus Christ, then it's absolutely truth. Now faith is truth. And you can't come to Jesus unless you believe in him. And he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Oh, I got to get back to the text, Isaiah, Apocalypse. So they have this big revival going on in Jerusalem. 5,000 people get saved. The man at the gate called beautiful, right? He expecting to receive something. 5,000 more get saved. It breaks out all over the city. It's an amazing revival, but great persecution comes against the church immediately. And Christians are being hunted down and, 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 and thrown into prison and put to death. And there's tremendous persecution, and Jews are being scattered. And Cornelius receives the Holy Ghost when Peter sees the sheet come down. And then when the, when the, when the word of God 
is received by the Gentiles and it begins to spread among the Gentile nations. And all of a sudden, revival breaks out across the world. The early church exploding on the scene with the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This was the first round. Satan lost. He tried to kill, remember, he tried to kill Moses. Then he tried to kill the children of Israel with the Nephilims, so trying to stop them from the birth of Christ. Christ comes. Herod says, we hear a king is born, slaughters all the babies again. Innocence slaughtered again, up to two years of age, trying to kill the Christ child, but he fails. The devil fails again. So now Satan says, I got to do something else. So he persecutes the church. That didn't work. He goes, I got to do something else. I know I do. I know that prophecy in Ezekiel, how the Lord said he's going to return Israel, how he's going to, can a, a nation be born in one day? Can the dry bones live? I got to stop the rebirth of Israel as a nation because if I could stop the rebirth of Israel as a nation, I could stop the king of kings returning to Jerusalem like he he said he's going to do. So I've now got got one last play left. I got to stop this from happening. And for 2,000 years, the the Jews are persecuted and despora out of Spain and are thrown out of here and are thrown out of there. They're scattered all over the world. And then not till 1948... On May the 14th, after, oh, by the way, God knew what day he was going to restore them, and Lucifer knew it too. That's why Adolf Hitler, at the age of nine, would walk into a museum in Austria, walk up to the Spear of Loganus or the Spear of Destiny, and stare at it every night, every day after he got out of school. And he said one day at the age of 13, a black cloud came out of the shadow box on the wall from that spear. The spear believed to be used to pierce Christ in the side. That that cloud, he said, entered it into his body. He studied the occult. He studied witchcraft. He was involved in satanic rituals. He worked, he, he was taken over. He became an antichrist figure of the last day. And so when he becomes the leader of Germany in 1939, he starts, of course, a war, not only to take over the world, but to eliminate the Jewish people and to prevent the rebirth of Israel as a nation. Satan's getting desperate now. And the Jews are slaughtered. And it's a holocaust of biblical proportion. But thank God, America, God had planted a Christian nation here that even though we didn't have the biggest army, and even though we were thousands of miles away from the battle, when it came our time to rise up to help Europe and the rest of the world from this mad, evil, uh, horrific demon, we had the people and the faith to know this was wrong and to go and to fight and to storm the beaches of Normandy and to take back what the devil was stealing and to shoot down and beat down and put down the Nazi extermination of God's people and to preserve some seed. Because it's a seed war, right, L.A.? And so we save a little bit of the seed, and they pull them out of concentration camps, and the dry bones were living now. They look like the dead bones of Ezekiel 37. And nobody in the world wanted these people, so throw them into the Canaan land, throw them into the homeland, the very land that was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that the rebirth of Israel would be done. And a nation was born in one day on May 14th, 1948. And God has blessed them abundantly, unbelievably. Not only they were attacked in 67, but attacked in 73 and been hated by almost every nation around them. And yet they have prospered and been blessed. And they're rising up for a final day. Why? Because the king of kings is coming back to the very city he said he left. He said, this same Jesus that you see going away is coming again in like manner. He's coming back. (laughs) Satan's running out of options is what I'm trying to say. So now Israel's been reborn. So what's left? The return of Christ. Well, what do I got to do to stop that? I got to try to stop the prophecies of the Bible. He goes to, he goes to Revelation. He goes to Isaiah 24, where it says that the world's going to be turned upside down. There's going to be all these catastrophes. 
He says, I gotta, I gotta stop the church. I gotta stop the Christians. Oh no, the Christians are, I, I gotta stop them. I'll divide them. I wanna say something. Paul McGuire last night did something so amazing when he asked that we all work together. What, you, what, what was amazing, and that's why I love to hear the Washington conferences. I wanna say this. You never hear the speakers throw off on the other speakers or, or other denominations or any of that. You don't ever hear that. I want to say that is amazing because that is what unity is about. That's, I mean, do you know what the Bible says it is? It's his, it's his how good, Psalms, how good, Psalms 133, how good and how pleasant it is that the brethren dwell together in unity for it's as pleasant as the anointing oil that flowed down the beard of Aaron to the skirts of his priestly garment. It doesn't get any, do you understand the anointing oil on the high priest? How powerful anointing it is, the anointing oil on the high priest? Unity in the church is as powerful as the anointing oil on the high priest. Who is our high priest? So when we work together, it's as strong as the anointing on Jesus Christ. That doesn't get, I got chills when I said that. Hey, come on. Come on. Are you serious? Unity is powerful. So whenever you, for the great revival to happen in the last days, we'll have to unify. Well, I can tell you a situation. Heidi and I are in an airplane flying from Indianapolis to Orlando, Florida for a conference. And we're on Delta flight, whatever. I think it was 777. We're on our way to heaven. I'm not sure. And we're going through the air, the front, and, and all of a sudden, boom, 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 left wing. We turn, everybody looks out the window. It's the engine completely blowing up. Black smoke is rolling. Fire, flames are shooting. At this moment, you, can you say to yourself, this isn't good? <laughs> all of a sudden, one of the pilots gets on the, on the intercom and says, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> this is your captain speaking. We've had a slight problem with one of our engines. But don't worry. We're going to take just a little stop in Atlanta. An emergency landing, but it'd be fine. <laughs> Ignore the smoke in the left windows. <laughs> and pray. And he hangs up the thing, and everybody goes to pray. People, everybody starts turning around, and all of a sudden, everybody knew everybody. <laughs> Catholics were hanging on to Baptists. <laughs> Presbyterians were falling in love with Pentecostals. <laughs> Nobody cared what denomination you were, and everybody was calling on one name, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Revival will sometimes comes out of persecution or precarious situations. Desperate measures may, re uh, desperate situations will require desperate measures. And literally, people were praying as the plane is coming down to land in Atlanta. Then the captain, God bless the captain. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been cleared to land, completely cleared. They have cleared the entire runway system. <laughs> but don't worry, there, if you see a few fire trucks, ambulances, EMTs, even morticians. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> Do not worry, for in Atlanta, they have a great record of dealing with these situations. Hang on, we're about to land. It may be choppy. <laughs> so we come in a little choppy, a little high, a little smoky, okay? Fire shooting. He lands the plane. It stops. Oh, by the way, I, I forgot to tell you, I did a video while I was doing this. I, my wife would not let me post it. She said, you're not posted. This is not a YouTube moment. <laughs> I said, are you serious? We're on a plane coming down. I mean, this is amazing. This is going to be a test. Of, I could have played it today. It would have been great. Put that thing down and pray. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> so we land the plane and the smoke is rolling 
and the walls are caving, and the people are shouting, and all of a sudden we turn around and look, and, the, and we don't even understand this one, but all the fire and smoke and everything just went stop. Because, you know, I was worried about land and then the plane catch on fire. I mean, seriously, just stop. So everybody started pleading, and people are hugging each other, and they're taking email addresses, and it's an amazing event. And we all get off the plane, and the pilot says, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for flying with Delta. I hope your experiences was one that you will never forget. This guy was amazing. And so they got us another plane. We left. We were on in Orlando. We had a great conference. But you know, the, the, the lesson I learned there was unity comes sometimes when there's nowhere else left to go. So God is begging the church to stop being divided. To stop being divided. Please work together. So you believe a little different on that and a little different on this. So some of you want to take communion every day. Some of you want to do it once a month. Some of you do it once a year. Some of you don't even know how to do it. So some of you want to be baptized. Some of you want to be sprinkled. Some of you want to be dunked. Some of you want to be sprayed. I haven't had one guy want to be sprayed. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Okay. I mean, we, we got all these issues. We got all these boxes of tissues. But what we need to do is work together. Because the Isaiah apocalypse is coming. But we want to be ready when the Lord comes. I plan on taking the first bus out of here, Gus, Seriously. I, I'm gone, okay? My ticket's been paid for a long time ago. I'm gone. I don't know when he's coming, but I'm out of here. Hallelujah. And I'm not flying Delta either. Hallelujah. <laughs> Unity is powerful. Unity is amazing. Unity is, is so amazing. When people lay aside small differences, pre-trip, mid-trip, post-trip, hey, forget the trip. Let's just get to heaven. Yeah, we all got problems. We all got issues. We're all going to deal with things. People are going to have losses their loved ones. I just had a cousin die last night. She was in church Sunday morning, 30 years old, two little babies. She was in church Sunday. I just preached in my dad's church Sunday. And uh, she died this week. She just died last night. She had a double aneurysm at the age of 30. She went on to be with the Lord. And we got these two little kids now you know, I, 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 I can't change it. There's some things you can't fix. You can only prepare people for. Sometimes God can change things. Sometimes things do change. Prayer does miraculous things. But something, the Bible even says there's a sickness unto death. I do not say you pray for that. So we have to, we have to understand that people get sick. Things happen. Life goes on, though. One thing that's eternal is your salvation with Christ. I mean, we, we come here to learn about all the things going on. A lot of great speakers this week, and everybody's done a tremendous job. And I thought I was really going to break down this chapter, and the Lord is saying, well, I've got a different message for you. You'll just have to tell them to get your DVD on Isaiah Apocalypse at your table. <laughs> all the footage is there. Because what we need is unity in the body of Christ. And if we get unity... And we will, because you can't have a revival without it. The Bible says in the book of Revelation 7, look what it says. There's 12. The Bible says, after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth. This is Revelation 7. That the wind should not blow on this earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw a wonder. I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. He cried with a loud voice to the four angels to them, given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we've sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So the apocalypse doesn't happen until the revival. And look who gets saved. I saw a number of them which were sealed. There was about 144,000. These are Jews. There are 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. Okay. And so they all are sealed with the seal of God. Now, the early church revival started in Jerusalem, spread to the Gentiles. The last day revival will start with the Jews. It will spread to the rest of the world. Look what it says. So you can read all of those, uh, and I won't go. We'll skip down to verse 9. After this, 
I beheld and lo a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts, and they fell before the throne on their faces, and they worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. And one of the elders answered, saying to me, What are these which are arrayed in these white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God. They shall serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall, praise the Lord, dwell among them. And they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, shall lead them into living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Can you say amen? The end time revival. All over the world, people coming to Christ. It's, I believe it's already starting. It's happening in places like Pakistan and India and Iran. It's already starting in Israel. Every time we go to Israel, more and more Jews are accepting Christ. Messianic Jews, every time we go, there's more of them everywhere. They even had their first Messianic uh, conference held there. Praise the Lord. It's, it's, it's been, now even Avi Lipkin started a political party called the Block Party, made up of Christians and Jews they're called the Bible Party. And they've already, and they've already been accepted accepted by the Knesset. I spoke at the Knesset 18 months ago. I, will, I, I can't believe it. I, I, they, I won't get to speak at the Congress of the United States, but I got to speak at the Knesset in Israel. And here's why. They invited pastors. They invited uh, Rosemary Schindler, Oscar Schindler's uh, niece, and she spoke, and I spoke, and her husband spoke, and two other pastors spoke, and three rabbis spoke, and we all read from the Word of God, and the Knesset was filled with Christians and Jews as we were sharing from the Bible that out of Jerusalem shall flow the word and the law of the Lord. It's a prophecy in the Bible. And as I was up there speaking, I said to myself, God, am I actually, am I actually seeing the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter two, where you said you would do this? And the Lord spoke to me, said, You are. It's the end. It's the last days. Preach to the people. Tell them to come to Jesus Christ. People ask me all the time, how close are we? We're very close. He's even at the door. He's ready to come. He said, watch and pray. For an hour you think not, the Son of Man cometh. He told you, he said, pray that you be worthy to escape the hour of temptation that's coming upon the world. Can you say amen? He told you to be ye ready. The Bible says, no man knows the day nor the hour. The Son of Man cometh. Praise the Lord. Not even the angels in heaven. Not even the Son of God, but his Father only. He said that in the last days, he would shorten the days. For the elect's sake, lest there be no flesh saved. I'm telling you, he's coming. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming soon. Hallelujah. Praise his holy name. They're going to, my grandmother, Pentecostal, they gave her a license to preach, but they wouldn't let her in the pulpit. So she'd get up and stand up in the crowd and say, thus saith the Lord. They're like, oh, no. And she would preach a little bit there and there, and she'd dance a little bit. She'd break out in an old song. Well, there ain't no grave. Gonna hold my body down. <laughs> no, there ain't no grave. Gonna hold my body down. Oh, yeah, she would. When I hear that trumpet sound, I'm gonna get up out of the ground for there ain't no grave. Gonna hold my body down. Mm -mm. Yeah. 
Well, I can promise you that on that great resurrection morning, my grandmother's going to come out of the grave. And boy, I got news for the devil. Because she's going to stomp all over his head with them high heel shoes of hers. <laughs> Grandma was so powerful, and, pre- and she, would, uh, she would help me when I first started preaching. And she always wanted me to be ready. And she always said, Paul, be filled with the Holy Ghost and lead people to Christ and turn no one away and love everybody and show that love. Let it flow out of you. You got to let it flow out of you. Do you understand what I'm saying, son? <laughs> yes, <my> Grandma. <laughs> People got to know you care. People got to see Christ in you. Do you understand that? There's, there's hurting people out there. There's people who are hurting. There's folks that come to these conferences that are hurting. They come up to every table. And we pray with them in the hallways. And, and I see you all praying for each other. And I, within a weekend, you become a body. You become a family. And there's not one person that we want to see not make it. We're going to get a song right now. Is that, is that, can you come? We're going to get a song. And we're going to, where's our sister? There she is. And uh, aren't they wonderful, by the way? <laughs> sister Lori. Sister Lori was sick and contacted our ministry, I think six years ago, was it? Something like that. Cancer. We sent her a prayer blanket. We send people prayer blankets when they're in stage four or respirators. We know what we, Heidi started the prayer blanket ministry called Rachel's Heart. We anoint those prayer blankets with oil. People give us blankets. They there's, there's these ladies out there that stitch, every stitch. They make them by hand, and they're praying, Jesus, heal. By your stripes, we're healed. They make these beautiful blankets and quilts, and they send them to us for free. And then, Heidi, we get letters every day. Someone's sick, someone dying, someone hurting. Heidi prays. The Lord shows her which blanket to send to which letter. Sometimes it's the, that person's favorite color, and we don't know it. Sometimes that they like butterflies, and that's the butterfly blanket. That's where it goes. We find out later. So she gets led by the Holy Ghost to do that. We anoint them with oil and pray over them. We send them out. Well, one, one went to you. She was healed of cancer. Now she's up here singing. The glory of the Lord. And I was listening to her sing this week and said, oh, my Lord, what, what a beautiful voice. Her, her son, tremendous talent here on the keyboard. And I thought to myself, this is what the power of God's about. This is what the world needs to know. This Jesus that we preach is real. You have real problems. He's got the real answer. And so as we all stand all over the building, if you would like to come, and accept Christ as your Savior, or if you would like to come and rededicate, or you'd like to come and pray, I want you to come. If you're going to be baptized, I'll start with you. Everyone getting baptized needs to come on up and stand all along the front. All of you who are being baptized, and all of you who might have came here and said, come on, all of you who stood up and said, I'm getting baptized, I'm going now. And if you're here and you're not saved, let's stand all over the building, everyone, if you would. Let's stand and let's, the, let's give us this, at this moment, this is one of the most powerful times, the whole conference, all the great word that we've heard from so many wonderful speakers. And so it kind of comes down to that decision moment, that moment where I'm going to choose Christ and go all the way with Christ. That moment when I, this little boy right here, I'm going to be baptizing him. He said he is my biggest fan. Little Nathan. Come here, Nathan. Help me out. Little Nathan came up to me and said, Pastor Paul, he had lunch with me. He took my picture 17 times. <laughs> Pulled out a little wad of change and said, if I had $100,000, I'd give it all to you. 
I said, you don't need to do that. He goes, no, I want you to have money to help get people saved. I said, this little boy right here, God's put something in his heart. I'm going to baptize him today. Get back down there, brother. Stand right down there. St stand right down there with the rest of them, okay? If you're here, if you're here and you say, Pastor Paul, I need to... I wasn't coming here. I, did, I, I didn't think I was going to get baptized. But you know, and maybe you've been baptized. But God's saying, we've moved into another level here, folks. We're in the end times now. It isn't when they're going to start. We're in them. And you're saying, and God speak, maybe speak into your heart right now. says, just go ahead and walk up there and just go ahead and get baptized. Didn't bring extra clothes. Don't matter. This, this is California. <laughs> if that's you, I want you to step out. Step out of the pew and say, you know what? I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to go forward. I'm making a commitment today. I want to go all the way. That's the way, sir. Come on. There's others. Come right on. Just step right out. Just say, I'm, there you go. Thank you. God bless you. If you're here and you're not saved and you say, I want to do that. There's others. There's others. That's the way, sister. That's the way. Mind the Lord. God bless you. I, if you're here and you want to be saved, I want you to come out of the pew and say, I want to be saved. I want to be saved. How many people are here right now? Is there any here right now that are not saved who are coming to be saved here this morning? Would you lift your hand? Would you lift your hand? Would you lift your hand? Is there anyone? Is there anyone here that's not saved that say, Pastor Paul, I'm not saved, but I definitely came to this convention and I'm, I'm learning about Jesus and I'm trying to figure out this thing and I do want you to pray for me. How many would lift your hand and say, just pray for me? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. This is it. This is it. These folks are coming to Christ. Praise God. If you're out there and you, why don't you come? And why don't you come? There's others that want to come forward. Come now. If, if there's anybody sick that needs healing, I want you to come now. I want you to understand the same Lord that saves and heals and delivers. He has power to do all things. If there's anybody sick, out there that needs healing, just come and stand up here as we get ready to pray for all the needs of the people. God's getting ready to do something supernatural. God's getting ready to do something spectacular. So God's getting ready to do an amazing move of God right now. And we, he wants you to know he loves you. That's the way. That's the way. Just trust God. Trust God. There's nobody else left to trust but Jesus. But who else should you trust? There, he is the way, the truth, and the life. That's the way. Praise God. He's a healer. Three years ago, we were at a Hear the Watchman conference when a, a, a lady came all the way from New Jersey, deathly ill with less than six weeks to live. Her husband brought her all the way from New Jersey, and we were having the speaker's dinner on Thursday night when Mike came and got me at the table and said, there's a, there's a couple out here. She's dying. And they've came all the way from New Jersey. Would you go out and pray for them? I said, yes. I got up, went out into the hallway, and there they were. Heidi had a blanket. We gave her a blanket. We anointed it. We laid hands. We prayed for her. Mike and Jeannie helped pray for her. They stayed all weekend. They went back home. And we got a letter from them. She was doing much better three months later. We got a letter again six months later. She was doing much better. A year later, we were down in Dallas. And guess who came to the conference? She came. She looked great. Her husband was there. And they were shouting because she had been healed. Listen, you might the, listen, the doctor could do everything he can do, but God can go beyond anything. All things are possible. We're going to pray, okay? Would you put your hand on the person next to you and reach out and take somebody's hand out there? And everybody pray together. Dear Lord, I come to you today. I come humbly and I come seeking. I want everything for my life that you want for me. I've come to you, Lord, my heart broken, seeking you, but I'm repenting of my sins. I'm confessing my sins to God, and I'm calling on the name of Jesus to save me, to break the chains, to release me from the bondage of sin. 
to forgive me of all sin and transgression. I'm renewing my covenant with you. I'm rededicating my life to you. I want to leave here changed, clean, alive, on fire for the kingdom of God. God, help me. I need you. But I love you, Lord. Satan, you're a liar. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And I call upon the name of the Lord to set me free because I believe, I believe, I believe, and I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Ghost, in Jesus' name, I am saved. I am saved. I am saved. Give the Lord some praise all over the building. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. <laughs> praise God, brother. Praise God. <laughs> praise God, brother. Let me just say this. Now we're going to pray for the sick. There's some of you that are sick here. Again, take everybody by the hand in a power of prayer of agreement. We're going to be baptizing folks in just a moment. But there is an anointing that breaks every yoke. Now we told you that when we're in unity, it's more powerful than the anointing on the high priest. That's Christ. So you understand the love of God is so deep. It's so, so strong. It's so beautiful. And I feel that anointing right now. I do. I feel strong. I feel a healing river flowing right now. Is there somebody got cancer here? Bless you in the name of anoint her. You got a well, Heidi. Anoint her. Anoint this sister, Heidi, right now. Right here. Anoint her right now. You have cancer? You're going to be healed. You're going to be healed, though, okay? In Jesus' name. You're going to be healed, okay? Because he said by his stripes we are healed. Anyone, someone else here with cancer? Anyone else here? Bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. All right. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just lay hands on this sister and we just believe. Lord, she comes to you humbly. Her spirit is clean. Her heart is real. And she's calling on the name of the Lord. So God, just let your miracle working power and anointing break this yoke off of her. We rebuke this spirit of sickness upon her, Lord, and that she be healed. She be healed by the power of the blood of the Jesus, of Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Praise you, Lord, for your healing power. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, all of you that have come, maybe you have heart conditions, lung conditions, you guys sing a song for me right now. There's nothing but the blood or whatever that song was you have. They're going to sing a song for us right now, and then we're going to pray a corporate prayer of healing. Keep holding hands as we sing. Oh, hallelujah. 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 If you're still here needing to be saved, come on.
nothing can for sin atone nothing but the blood of Jesus not of good that I have done nothing but the blood of Jesus no Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful time of worship. Lord, you know there are some that are sick in their body that need to be healed. And by your stripes, we are healed. We receive our healing today. Emphysema, heart condition, diabetes. We receive our healing. Migraine headaches, tumors. We receive our healing today, Lord, in Jesus' name. As they tied him to the whipping post, as he was like a lamb led to the slaughter, he opened not his mouth. He bore our sins and our griefs. He was stricken and smitten of God, a man of sorrow. He was acquainted with grief, Lord, yet he opened not his mouth. He had no beauty that we should desire him. But Lord, I'm so glad that the chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes were healed. So, Lord, right now I ask that you touch every soul in this building. Heal all diseases and sicknesses and plagues. Let them not come nigh our dwelling. Let this remnant church go forward, Lord, with a revival fire within them to take it back to their home churches and places of worship and people and families and friends and workplaces and wherever they may go. Let them carry that, that armor, that whole armor of God and Let them be a light to the world. Let them witness to those that don't know you. Let this revival break out of Irvine, California. You did it once in Azuzu Street in L.A. You can do it again in Irvine. That something can happen. That a year from now, whenever they return, when the the watchmen return, that there be triple the crowd and a hunger that they'll be literally beating down the doors to get in and people will come in shouting and believing and expecting and receiving the end time message and the prophetic word of God of the last days. We thank you for every speaker and for all those that have participated in this great conference and those that are still yet to go. So now be with us all as we go down to the pool for baptism May the water be troubled with the Holy Ghost. And may the blessing fall upon all those that come. And we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory in Jesus' name. And the people said, amen. Amen. And God bless all of you. Praise God. I hear the Savior say, thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Now indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone Can change the leper's spots And melt this heart of stone Jesus paid it all left 
the crimson stain he washed it white as snow it's washed away all my sin and all my shame hallelujah and when before the throne stand in him complete Jesus died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat let's sing it out Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow he washed it white as snow he washed it 